Good afternoon, and welcome to ACRP's webinar entitled Fresh Ideas in Workforce Development, during which we will learn some of the most inventive and cutting-edge ways organizations are approaching workforce development and how you can put them to work for you. We will have the pleasure of hearing from Workforce Innovation Award finalists from the University of North Carolina Wilmington, MUSC, and Merck. Before we get started, we would like to bring to your attention some of the features available to you. We want today's webinar to be interactive and as such encourage you to submit questions to our moderator and presenters using the questions tab on the left side of your screen. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time, referencing the name of the finalist when doing so. To access the note taking feature, click on the notes tab on the right side of the screen. You will see a white text box where you can take notes, which will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the session. If you experience any technical issues, please click Request Support in the lower left corner of the screen. Technicians are standing by to assist. Today's esteemed moderator is Beth Harper, ACRP's Workforce Innovation Officer. She is a staunch advocate for the industry, pursuing solutions for optimizing protocols, enhancing patient recruitment and retention, and imp improving sponsor and site relationships. We are very glad to turn the program over to Beth. Thank you, Kristen. Good afternoon, everyone. So delighted you could join us for what promises to be a very interesting presentation from our finalists for the Workforce Innovation Award 2020. Let me just briefly um, do a few notes of uh, introduction, tell you a little bit about the Workforce Innovation Award and how we got to where we are today. And then I'll briefly touch on the session and we'll get right into hearing from our finalists. So the Workforce Innovation Award, this is our third year of recognizing organizations that really are advocating on behalf of the workforce in clinical research, either through growing and diversifying the workforce, through helping to enhance the competency of the current workforce, or really just helping professionals in the clinical research world grow and advance their career. So we have a really diverse set of presentations today that will touch on uh, quite a number of these topics. We issue a call for proposals for the uh, award early in the year. So this was uh, way back in February or so of 2020. The um, applications really help to characterize um, who was the initiative intended to benefit, what was the initiative involved, and what accomplishments were achieved, as well as how um, competencies, the competency framework was embedded into their particular initiatives. The awards, uh, the finalists were um, evaluated by our partners and workforce Ad advancement or PWA members who selected the three finalists that we'll be hearing from today. And then our executive steering committee will be voting after the sessions today on the first, second and third place winners who, will, who we will recognize uh, through various uh, presentations and so forth. So each finalist will have about 15 minutes for their uh, presentation. We will um, complete all of the presentations and then address the questions as Kristen noted. Please feel free to send those in through the Q&A log and be sure to address which uh, presentation you're particularly interested in hearing from or which company. And then um, if we don't have time, I anticipate we'll have quite a few questions. If we don't have time, we will compile those and follow up with you uh, separately. But we do welcome your questions and we'll get to as many as we can. So in order of the presentations, uh, first we'll be hearing from uh, the University of North Carolina Wilmington team uh, with Ms. Tiffany Erickson and representing her group on the FUSE CR program. Then we'll be hearing from uh, the Medical University of South Carolina with Claire and her team talking about the Matrix project. And then finally, we'll hear from the Merck Clinical Research Laboratories group, Michelle leading things off on their clinical research awareness and early talent development program. So three very interesting, very innovative uh, um, initiatives, and I'm sure you'll all um, learn a lot. So with that, um, let me uh, extend a warm welcome to Tiffany and your colleagues from the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, and we'll take it away. Thank you, Beth. Good afternoon. My name is Tiffany Erickson, and I am the coordinator of the Center for Clinical Research Workforce Development at UNC Wilmington. Thank you for this opportunity to share the story of FUSCR. 
I'd like to introduce you to the core program development and implementation team. Dr. Jim Blom, Professor of Depar Department of Math and Statistics. Mr. Randall Johnson, Executive Director of the Southeastern Office of the North Carolina Biotechnology Center. And Dr. Susan Sinclair, former professor in the Clinical Research Department. The project is supported by the UNC Wilmington College of Health and Human Services, Department of Math and Statistics, the Faculty in the Clinical Research Department, the North Carolina Biotechnology Center, and the North Carolina Clinical Coast Clinical Research Initiative. The Duke Energy Foundation awarded the in initiative a substantial competitive grant of $390,000 to support initial startup funding. A wide range of clinical research companies from small entrepreneurial ventures to large multinational corporations supported and guided development of the program, including PPD, BioStudy Solutions, INC Research, and PMG Research. The continual issue we all face is the creation, reinforcement, and strengthening of the local skilled workforce and company base in order to strengthen our competitive advantage relative to other regions, states, and countries. We want to encourage our existing companies and professionals to stay here and grow here, and to encourage new companies and professionals to locate to our area. From an economic development perspective, there are many ways to address competitive advantage. One of the key ways is related to talent development and attraction. Some would say workforce development. When you think about attracting and retaining the best companies in your area, you have to attract and retain the best talent. You have to ensure a sufficient talent base to meet the current and future needs of local companies. You have to ensure adequately skilled local workforce for clinical research, including soft skills. You need ease of access for existing professionals to access meaningful, ongoing professional development and certifications locally. And you need strong networks of connections between clinical research professionals, faculty, students, and industry partners. In 2014, we had a strong cluster and a strong talent base in our region, but we wanted to improve and build on those strengths. A group of leaders from the university and industry, along with community partners, convened to identify and address these sub-issues related to competitive advantage and to establish Southeastern North Carolina as the home to the best trained, most highly skilled, effective and well-connected community of clinical research professionals anywhere in the world. To make that vision a reality, the team sought out to achieve two goals. One, to strengthen and grow the existing and future talent base or workforce for the local clinical research industry through professional development, educational enhancements, networking opportunities, and a shared workspace. And two, to promote economic development in the local region through greater collaboration between university and industry and access to world-class talent. To achieve these goals, the group formed a leadership team to identify and address areas for improvement in the local clinical research professional community. First, we elicited direct feedback from industry partners, faculty, and students using focus groups, surveys, and the formation of an advisory council consisting of local clinical research industry leaders, educators, and students. The team developed a plan to address the workforce issues shared by these local industry partners as barriers to their growth or needs for success. Then we sought and received internal and external funding to establish FUSE-CR to develop programs to address industry workforce needs. We established the FUSE-CR Clinical Research Workforce Development Center and included programming, events, and a shared workspace. We continue to engage and work with stakeholders by gathering program feedback, conducting needs assessments, focus groups and in-depth interviews, and hosting advisory council meetings. In Southeastern North Carolina, faculty, staff, students, community partners, and industry leaders have joined together to further FUSCR's mission. 
FUCR is a collaborative initiative designed to ignite a new synergy between UNCW and the clinical research industry. Next slide. By fusing resources and knowledge from academia and industry, FUCR is energizing the local clinical research talent with powerful career and industry enhancing services. The FUCR initiative has sought to accomplish the following objectives. Educate the next generation of talent. Prepare students for the workplace. Enhance our existing workforce and build connections between academia and industry. To educate the next generation of talent, FUCR engaged in the following activities. We, we um, and establish curricular enhancements to our current clinical research program. We developed a post-baccalaureate certificate program in clinical research operations, allowing students with a bachelor's degree who want to transition into the field the ability to gain admissions into our master's program without experience. We've created foundational courses for transitioning professionals who want to move into this industry and give them an overview of the of the industry. And we created the FUCR Student Ambassador Program. The Student Ambassador Program is for students majoring in clinical research who want to help spread the word about careers in the industry. They come to FUCR to hone their elevator pitch about clinical research as an attractive career. And then they set up tables at events that cater to students on campus. They go to major fairs, transfer student recruitment events, and student or organization fairs to tell other students, their peers, about the clinical research major. To prepare students for the workplace, we developed an industry fellowship program that gives students hands-on research experience. We coordinate one-on-one -on -one resume reviews and mock interviews for students with volunteer industry professionals. We created a mentorship program and we offer, off, offer career preparation workshops for students throughout the year. One of our students disclosed to me that her mother works in a warehouse and that she has no experience with adults who work in a professional office setting. She described her mentor guidance as invaluable in learning how to navigate an office environment that was foreign to her. Her mentor remarked on the change she witnessed throughout the year. She said this student started as a passive participant and evolved into a proactive mentee who sets goals for our meetings and arrives prepared with her own agenda. This is a testament to the power of the FUCR mentorship program in building professionalism and leadership skills. To enhance our existing workforce, we have created a robust continuing education program. We offer professional development offer opportunities that includes workshops on communication, leadership, and professional skills. We have a speaker series, and we also offer networking events that students, faculty, and community members within the industry can attend together to build those connections. To build more connections between academia and industry, we built a collaborative workspace on the edge of our campus. We established and continue to host meetings of our advisory council on a regular basis. And we created action teams of leaders who are willing to put time into the FUCR program to development, to develop, implement, and see it succeed. The collaborative workspace is central to the FUCR program. Industry partners, faculty, and students come together formally and informally to learn from each other. The FUCR space is unique and versatile with state-of-the-art technology and the ability to accommodate small and large groups. We have a shared space, a conference room, and private offices. One of our small local clinical research companies, Array Biostatistics, does not have a brick and mortar space but they were able to host a summer intern using our office space. They would not have been able to do so from their home offices. Establishing, establishing this collaborative workspace has provided opportunities for new and small companies to host team meetings and connect with other team members across the globe with our T1V technology. We know this effort was needed and is appreciated by the local clinical research community from the favorable feedback, outcoming, outcomes, and ongoing activity of the initiative. 
Since the completion of our collaborative workspace in 2017, FUCR has partnered with over 30 collaborators, hosted more than 300 programs with more than 800 participants with a satisfaction rating of over 95%. In part because of FUSR, FUSCR, the local clinical research industry cluster has continued to grow with new jobs and better access to more highly skilled local talent. Existing employees have a source for ongoing professional development offered locally throughout their careers. Recent clinical research program graduates are better prepared to hit the ground running when entering the workforce. And clinical research industry employers, employees, and students have stronger networks of professional connections. This, this initiative enhances clinical trial competency across the industry. The primary focus of FUSCR has been on increasing the competency of professionals in roles performing clinical research operations, data management, and SAS programming. FUSCR is designed to build and enhance the local talent pool to create a highly trained workforce in all roles. We map the competency domains to our activities, and all eight competency domains are incorporated throughout the components of our program including in our activities to educate the next generation, such as curricular enhancements and applied learning experiences. Those that prepare students for the workplace, such as our professional development opportunities. And those that enhance our existing workforce, such as continuing education programming and networking events. After five years of learning from and growing alongside the local clinical research community, FUSCR strives each day to identify new ways to further its role in increasing the region's competitive advantage. To other institutions and regions considering implementing such a program, we offer the following recommendations. Engage and collaborate with a wide range of partners from industry, government, economic development agencies, and academia. Consistently solicit, listen to, and incorporate feedback from those partners. Devise a stable and sustainable revenue model at the outset. Secure a dedicated internal resource to lead the effort as early as possible. Enlist pillars of local industry and community leaders to tell your story. And stay relevant and evolve with the community and industry. Keep listening. Our most valuable lesson from this experience is that mutually beneficial relationships lead to long-term committed stakeholders, providing the foundation for a sustainable program. The key to success is to stay innovative, be creative and adapt to evolving needs and shifting priorities. If you have strong partnerships, change will always bring opportunity. We are thrilled to have had the opportunity to share what we've learned in our experience with you today. I hope learning a bit about FUCR and what we do will be a benefit to you and that you have heard some things today that might help to strengthen your respective clinical research communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Really, really interesting program. And I can uh, say on behalf of everyone, what amazing accomplishments in five years to have engaged that many stakeholders and achieved uh, su such successes. So uh, congratulations uh, to you and the team and thank you for um, your presentation. Thank you, Beth. All right, so we'll turn now to our next group, uh, MUSC's uh, matrix team and let me turn it over to um, Claire to lead the way with discussing how MUSC has attacked the Clinical Research Workforce Innovation with Matrix. And Claire, let me just make sure you're not on mute. So yes, we can thank hear you. you. There you well, are, thank you. Thank you, I made sure that I was gonna unmute, but it didn't happen. But good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Beth, for the introduction. I have here today um, my development team and co-presenters, Sarah Brewer and Jackie Carter. Uh, we also have Dr. Patrick Bloom. Um, he is not with us presenting today, but he has served as our leadership champion from the very beginning of this initiative. 
So here is our clinical research matrix timeline. Next slide, Beth, thanks. And as you can see, we started down this journey almost a decade ago. In late 2012, our research leadership met with HR directors to discuss the recruitment and retention challenges that we were experiencing in our clinical research workforce. And I have to say that this meeting was extremely pivotal. It really opened up the discussion to think innovatively and outside of our state systems box. Um, it really starts the, the um, mark of, of our phase one. Um, and shortly thereafter, we convened a group of stakeholders to address these challenges. We actually did not anticipate that this was going to be a multi-phase project, but in 2017, we did embark on phase two, and we just recently wrapped that up in early 2020. So our presentation today is going to walk you through um, our work to overhaul the clinical research workforce. So why did we engage in this decade-long initiative? Well, we didn't realize it was going to be such a, you know, it would take so much time, but it did. Um, and I think the important thing here is that we, we really work to change the culture. When I started as a research coordinator, um, the coordinator position was really looked at as a stepping stone for those who were seeking a medical degree. It wasn't looked at as a professional um, career um, back 20 plus years ago. Um, however, the complexity of research has significantly grown over the years, and it is such a heavily regulated industry that losing someone who had developed the skills, the knowledge, and the competency to navigate through this very complex research environment was devastating. So like many other academic medical centers, we were experiencing extremely high turnover. And high turnover translates to poor research quality. And it also has a costly impact as study milestones are not met. So just as a, a background, MUSC is part of our state's human resources class and comp system. And so we have to work within those confines. Clinical research did not have its own distinct job category in our state system. And that was resulted in a large variability in position types and inequity of compensation. Positions were either being inflated or deflated to get the desired salaries. And then movement within one's own classification band was extremely difficult. And that resulted in a lot of job hopping internally to seek that salary increase. And so basically, simply, there just was no professional pathway. You were sort of capped when you came in to a research position here at MUSC. Um, in addition, our South Carolina state bands simply could not stand up to the external market competition. So our top talent was being drawn away with better career opportunities and compensation. So our solution was to attack the clinical research, um, I'm sorry, our solution was to attack and change this culture by developing a professional pathway for the clinical research workforce. And we're going to play a very short video um, describing our endeavors during these two phases. And then I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Brewer, who's going to summarize our goals and accomplishments in each of the phases. You can go ahead and begin the video. The Clinical Research Staff Job Classification Project is a result of an MUSC Workforce Development Initiative that began in 2013. A number of issues existed at MUSC in the classification of employees who were engaged in research. The development of the matrix addressed these issues as well as helping to establish a research career development track. First, a work group of stakeholders was established from each of these groups. Next, an HR rep shadowed research coordinators to understand what the position entailed. Other academic medical centers were consulted, and finally, market data was reviewed. The results of the work group was the development of the MUSE Research Classification Excel-based matrix. Clinical research coordinator positions were assigned to three specific state classifications to create a consistent research track, Program Assistant, Program Coordinator 1, and Program Coordinator 2. The work group established research subclassifications, Novice, Journey, Advanced, to enhance MUSC's workforce development and provide a clear career path for clinical research staff. 
The new salary scale that was developed added a 5% premium to the state pay band for human subject research positions. The goals for the second phase of the research classification project were to better adapt the matrix for new hires, enhance the tool to encompass the wide range of human subject research activities conducted at MUSC, and enhance and address challenges from phase one. The initial matrix was released just prior to the publication of the Joint Task Force's Clinical Trial Competency Framework. Phase two sought to align the existing matrix with this framework and integrate and build upon the research competency statements set forth by a supplemental CTSA grant. The stakeholders researched and collaborated with other academic medical centers to identify a research classification tool that already incorporated the core competency framework. Duke Medical Center's Title Picker Red Cap Survey tool was adopted and modified. Competency statements were further refined to meet the needs of MUSC's research environment. The tool was tested against the original matrix. A number of future plans are envisioned related to this initiative. For more information and resource links, please visit the Human Resources website or send an email to researchmatrix at musc.edu. Thank you for watching. So the video we just viewed summarizes this project fairly well. So I'm just going to touch on some of the highlights of each of the phases and features of the tool. We began phase one with no existing standardized framework for clinical research job classification. The NUSC's research stakeholders internally defined a number of research domains and developed research competencies that accounted for position responsibility and complexity in order to determine the classification framework. The matrix included three state position levels associated with existing job titles that were then broken down into three different leveled subclassifications with corresponding compensation categories that were also aligned with the internally derived clinical research competencies. This classification structure combined with the candidate's research certifications, education, and research experience was then used to determine compensation using our Excel-based tool. Additionally, new compensation premiums were devised to account for the complexity and responsibility associated with human subject research positions, and that premium was layered onto the existing state compensation categories. And in the final stage of phase one, we mapped the existing workforce into the new standardized research framework utilizing our Excel-based matrix tool. This is an example of our Excel-based tool. It consists of the internally developed domains for supervisors to rate categorically. It also includes our CEE table, which is, contains the certification, education, and experience information. Once completed, HR can unlock the spreadsheet to reveal the classification and salary for each individual, which are based on formulas we developed in collaboration with the statistician. Next slide. Uh, we then undertook phase two to address some of the challenges from phase one. Um, it was important to us to align the new tool with the Joint Task Force Competency Domains for Clinical Research Professionals, as well as research core competency statements released by the NCAT 201 Supplemental Grant. Thankfully, Duke was pioneering and incorporating this framework in both sets of statements and their job descriptions. And so this resource proved to be a lifesaver for us as Duke publicly shares their work, and we were able to adapt their tools to fit our internal framework and processes. One of the Biggest changes we made though in structuring the implementation of phase two was establishing a matrix support team consisting of both research liaisons and HR representatives to provide support, training, maintenance, and review for each matrix completed. We also worked proactively with investigators and hiring managers to address issues as they arise and to advise HR on the aspects of these roles that are unique to the clinical research arena. Another of the major undertakings in phase two was the new format of the matrix tool. By using REGCAP, we were able to improve the management of the tool and the usability of it. In addition, it can be used to facilitate writing job descriptions or postings, as well as for professional development planning with staff in the matrix. Please. This new format also allowed us to not only categorize the sections of the matrix according to the Joint Task Force Compute domains, but also to incorporate many of the NCAT's core competency statements. Thank you. Um, in addition to updating our research domains and competency statements, we were also able to incorporate a program development and management section to account for the unique complexities and responsibilities of some of our more advanced positions while still working within our somewhat limited state classification options. 
The new tool also provides for entry of percent effort dedicated to the different domains to get a better understanding of primary responsibility. And finally, we added a couple of special comment sections for hiring managers to provide information that addresses any unique characteristics of the position or study needs, creating a little flexibility for hiring managers to express their special considerations within a standardized tool. Finally, we created a separate output form available only to HR and matrix teams. It now provides the classification and salary ranges in addition to the recommended salary in order to provide hiring managers the ability to weigh internal equity among staff when making hiring salary decisions. In human resources, one of our biggest challenges was the ability to track our research employees. Uh, prior to phase one, we had no idea who was matrix or who was research and who was not. So phase one really began the beginning of us tracking metrics. And as you can see, we ran 177 people through the Excel-based matrix with the average salary increase of about 15%. Uh, we felt that this was due mainly to the focus on classifications and the leveling of positions, and that resulted in some fairly significant increases. With the ability to track our research workforce into phase two, we moved and grew to about 250 people with the average salary increase this time around of about 7%, which resulted in almost $750,000 of payroll dollars to the bottom line. And um, we felt that this increase was really focused, uh, since we were focused on classifications the first time around, this was really focusing on making sure that our employees had a market competitive salary. Uh, with the ability to track our hires, we now realize that 44% of our research postings were actually promotions or internal transfers. And music to a talent acquisition manager's ears, we um, decreased our declined offers by about 12%. Uh, not only does phase one um, allow us to track our workforce, but it also provided the employees with a professional pathway. They're now able to visualize the growth potential and follow that path forward to get there. With the addition of the red cap matrix, it really reduced the subjectivity of the rating structure of the Excel based matrix and moved it to more of a competency based system, which resulted in pay equity, pay transparency. Um, as they ran through the, the matrix, these classifications were coming out very unbiased, as well as the salaries. So what you see is what you would get. Uh, we all knew what a, a program coordinator one journey level would be paying and those similar duties had similar job classifications as well. So there were actually a number of unanticipated accomplishments that have spun out of this initiative as a result of our close collaborations with our HR department. MUSC established an HR research liaison, and that is currently Jackie, um, and we meet monthly with our champion to address and streamline research workforce barriers at an HR level. Um, I think one of our greatest achievements um, was our success in aligning the benefits of our research grant employees with our state classified employees. But we've also addressed after hour and on call pay bonuses and we removed duplicative hiring processes for a more rapid onboarding. Our, um, we also partnered, partnered to strengthen and promote the clinical research pipeline. And we co-present to various MUSC graduating classes. We participate in job fairs for transitional workforce recruitment. And we have developed research career resources for dissemination at these fairs. Our HR research liaison also serves as a member on our CTSA's Workforce Development Corps. And together, we both collaborate on ACRP's Partners in Workforce Advancement Initiative. So what are the keys to success? Transforming a culture is certainly challenging and it takes time. I think the starting point is absolutely, you've got to identify that leadership champion. I cannot emphasize the importance of this. Our champion repeatedly met with HR directors, college deans, chairs, and other executive leaders. And he has met with numerous upon numerous investigators explaining our mission and goals. You also have to engage a large number of stakeholders to support this cause, and they need to be part of the discussion, and they also need to have a voice in the solution for its success. Uh, we had focus groups, we had pilot groups, we had meetings with research and business administrators, individual PIs and coordinators, and the list goes on. But I think that we're all aware that the key stakeholder here is going to be somebody in your HR department. Um, you've got to have that advocate in HR. So that the champion and the HR stakeholder are really crucial and critical to the success of an initiative like this. 
resources. Um, still a challenge for us. An overhaul such as this takes a lot of personnel resources and who's gonna pay for that? Dissemination, training, and communication. Um, this is one of the lessons learned between phase, phase one and phase two. I really think that this needs to be ongoing and it needs to occur pre and post rollout. You've got to frame the issue um, and you've got to repeatedly frame the issue to your entire research enterprise. But you also need to continuously educate as to what your missions and goals are. Um, I think this is a really valuable opportunity to help shift a culture. The earlier video that you saw um, is actually one of our training tools and it's embedded in our um, red cap uh, matrix so that when we meet with investigators who may sh or supervisors who show some skepticism and they are out there um, that, you know, we share that video and once they see it, they, they get it. They absolutely get it and they understand and they're supportive and they are so much more amenable to um, engaging in the additional workflows that we may have implemented as a result of this initiative. Um, ongoing evaluation. I think it's really important to go back to the stakeholders. You've got to hold those focus groups, see what's working, what's not, and then make those changes. And patience. This is monumental. It's You're going to be scaling the mountain out there on your own. At times, you're going to feel very alone, um, but just persevere. Next slide, please. Um, you know, just persevere. You'll get through it. Um, as you can see, this is a very long timeline for us. Um, we all have other responsibilities. We had competing priorities. We lost stakeholders along the way. Um, and there were certainly pauses along, you know, as you can see, we had a, a longer pause between 2015 and 2017. Um, but I think the payoff of having a professional career ladder for your clinical research workforce is just vital and critical to its success um, and for any research enterprise. So thank you, everyone. Back to you, Beth. Thank you, uh, Claire, Jackie, and Sarah for um, enlightening us in your heroic uh, journey this last 10 years. Who knew? But what a great accomplishment. And last but not least, um, we'll turn it over to hear from the industry side on how they have tackled um, growing and enhancing the workforce at Merck Research Laboratories. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. And um, we are honored to be able to join the teams here and speak to what we are doing in terms of increasing clinical research awareness and what early talent development looks like at Merck, at Merck Research Labs. Go ahead. The team we have gathered, uh, Ellen Balistreri, myself, Deb Pritchett, Ellie Redfield, Jill Ryan, and Leslie, all are just representatives of a group that is widespread, that participate in both um, awareness of the industry as well as this early talent development program we have, but these are the individuals that are joining us today. Next slide, please. Thanks. So why are we joining you? My Merck colleagues and I are here to share with you, all, with all of you, how we're addressing the clinical trial expansion and explosion that we're seeing right now. In 2020, there have been 325,817 clinical trials registered in clintrials.gov. That's just through October. This represents an 11.8% growth over last year. And last year, there was, over, there was almost a 12% growth over the year before. So as you can see, the clinical research space is growing exponentially. And as such, is in need of an expanding team of professionals with specialized positions and a variety of roles to manage this type of increasing workload. Over the course of the past three to five years, it's become apparent that the clinical research workforce is just not keeping pace with the demand for clinical trial personnel, and hence the recent pressure to identify innovative and novel opportunities for expanding that workforce through the identification, development, and promotion of personnel. So engaging a highly competent and technically capable, driven, diverse clinical research force is a critical factor in accomplishing our goals of timely, expeditious, and very high quality clinical research. It's never been more apparent than right now in the regulated and complex, highly technical environment in which we currently practice. So to proactively and strategically address these impending needs, Merck implemented a three-tiered approach focusing on youth outreach, interns at the collegiate level, and then entry-level postgraduate opportunities. 
We're accomplishing this through efforts to increase and enhance awareness of the clinical research industry and the potential professions within it with the impl implementation of our ambassador program. And in concert with our ambassador program, we're concentrating on increasing our identification, training, development, and promotion of early talent with our intern and our intern to hire programs, wherein we engage a very broad and diverse STEM candidate pool very differentiated in the pool from which we've been able to pull in the past. So let's start where we're starting with our ambassador program and Ellen. Hi, good afternoon. In 2018, the Clinical Research Ambassador Program began. The goal was to increase awareness in clinical research as a profession, as well as generating interest in STEM careers. We felt we could use our professional expertise to educate youth about STEM careers while focusing on STEM students who are generally unaware of the opportunities in the field of clinical research. High school and college age students are our target audience, and we have received overwhelming interest that prompted us to expand the program to include youth organizations. The outreach program is designed for MERC employees to volunteer within their own community and share the details about how therapeutics are created, tested, and brought to market. The MERC volunteers discuss employment possibilities, various career paths, resources, as well as sharing their personal journey within the profession. The program specifically highlights the clinical research associate as one example of a career in clinical research, while providing the volunteer flexibility to share other roles and professions. Interest in the clinical research ambassador program has been overwhelming by Merck employees and the communities where they live. They have been invited to return on subsequent visits to present the CRA ambassador material again to other classes and STEM students, as well as being invited to career fairs, new job outreach, and other exploration events. This, uh, next slide please, sorry. This is a picture of one of our Merck volunteers, Michelle Langston. She was invited to Fayetteville State University in North Carolina to speak. Her time was spent with first year STEM students. Michelle stated, and I quote, it was the most gratifying, amazing experience, and I have a new appreciation for education because I was exhausted but happy. Over two days, I spoke to seven STEM classes and hundreds of first-year STEM students. The students were highly engaged and posed some very thought-provoking questions. The slide that generated the most discussion was on the development of new drugs. They were fascinated to discover it took 10 to 15 years to approve one drug at a cost of one to $2 billion. I even had a few first year students tell me after the presentation, they were considering changing their majors. Next slide. In June of 2020, our own development team met with the leadership of the Boys and Girls Club of Atlantic City, New Jersey. We created and outlined a seven lesson, virtually led weekly course, ending with a certification in clinical research for the attendees. We presented the first iteration of this partnership to students ages 13 to 16 in July and August of this year. The course content detailed clinical research overview, diversity in clinical trials, clinical trial design, informed consent, phases in clinical trial research, patient recruitment, and adverse events. And because this was a virtual learning environment, we designed interactive games to demonstrate clinical research concepts and added knowledge checks to further promote understanding of the topics. Regular touch point calls were held with the Boys and Girls Club leadership and our own development team to discuss current course content and if revisions were needed to, to better engage our audience. The final week of the course was devoted to hearing feedback from our students and planning for future presentations. The program was well received and generated so much more excitement. This was a pilot program and delivered in a virtual setting. Because of the interest, we are now expanding to other boys and girls clubs throughout the country. And with that, thank you so much for the opportunity to share this program with you. And we would now like to share with you Merck's summer internship and the intern to, to employee programs. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ellen. So since 2017, Merck has offered three month summer internships to rising college graduates, with the number of interns tripling in the first three years. 
They come from diverse STEM backgrounds pursuing vastly different degrees from molecular genetics, epidemiology, biostatistics, pre-med, bioengineering, a gamut really across the board. The interns come and they're embedded into Merck and most don't even know about clinical research until the internship. Their summer with Merck encompasses work on projects across a variety of functional areas, including clinical operations, monitoring excellence, data management, clinical scientists, and even discovery. From day one, they also begin to be exposed to a multitude of different roles outside of their um, project work. They, they are begin their networking with um, more formal programs, such as career fairs, and informally via what we sometimes dug it, uh, dub as Friday coffee talks and other informal one-on-ones geared to help interns network with other research professionals. These networking opportunities really are an expansion of our clinical ambassador program, opening up a whole new world of job opportunities these interns never knew they existed. And while they're still engaged in the internship, we like to try to capitalize on their energy and enthusiasm by offering the opportunity to our high performing interns to apply for clinical trial coordinator, CTC positions with higher dates after their graduation. So when they leave, they're able to really go back to school focus on their studies without having to worry about future job employment, knowing that they have secured a position with Merck after their graduation. We're really excited that of the interns in the clinical operations space, we currently have a 30% conversion rate from intern to full-time employee. And as we continue to grow this program, we know those numbers will really increase. Next slide, please. So the second phase of our intern to hire program is really transitioning from intern to full-time employee. This phase gives us the opportunity to retain talent and also to continue to grow it. Post-graduation, they return to Merck with cap and gown in hand, ready to launch their research career as members of our clinical trial operations team in that clinical trial coordinator role. They begin with a robust, multifaceted onboarding program, and that includes formal training, as well as applied hands-on um, application, which includes assessing core competencies along the way. Their development further uh, continues with upskilling, not only within that CTC job role, but through exposure to it to growth opportunities in other roles of interest, like CRA, clinical operations manager, data manager, um, clinical scientist, to name a few. And after they've identified their preferred career path, then we support and assist them in transitioning to their next position of choice. All three of these initiatives, the ambassador, the intern, and the intern to hire program work to generate an informed, competent talent pool to enhance our diverse, multi-generational workforce, really focusing on long-term career, career growth. Next slide, please. So I'd like to show you a few of our initial uh, interns, CTC hires. I'm really proud to introduce you specifically by the way, initially of a video, but now live and in person, Ellie Redfield. She's one of our CTC cohort, um, cohort one CTCs, and she would like to share her personal journey through this program with you. Thank you, Leslie. Hi, my name is Ellie Redfield, and I was part of the Intern to Hire Pilot Program, coming from an internship within MRL Discovery Immuno-Oncology and became a full-time employee as a clinical trial coordinator. I studied biological engineering at Cornell University and had never considered a career path in clinical trials until my time during my Merck internship. During my internship, there was ambassador outreach internally, where I learned about clinical trials as a career path from the regional North America head of clinical trials, 
and had the opportunity to speak with her one-on-one -on -one about the field. Having always enjoyed the scientific process and having an appreciation for the research which goes into drug development, I realized an opportunity to experience the application of this research by working within clinical trials. Not only did this opportunity expose me to a career path in clinical trials, but it really facilitated the transition from the classroom to the corporate world by providing an opportunity to apply for a CPC position. The transition consisted of an immersive competency-based program with focused skill and industry immersion training. The training began with an external educational model and immediate immersion into supervised clinical trials with designated experienced mentors to provide detailed one-on-one -on -one job role training. The robust communication between the new employees, our managers and mentors provided an environment allowing for ownership and growth with rapid independent trial management development growth opportunity, opportunities available. One of these growth opportunities being able to contribute to the ambassador program and going to local schools to speak about the significance of the clinical trial workforce in hopes to inspire the future talent. Having been in the role for 16 months, I am transitioning to becoming a CRA and utilizing the skills I learned as a CTC. I feel that the intern to hire program not only enhances the quality of Merck's growing workforce, building the diverse multi-generational Merck family, but it really educates and inspires young individuals by sparking their interest to begin to explore potential careers in STEM. I'm forever grateful for this experience and the pathway the intern to hire program provided into the clinical trial workforce. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. Ellie, Ellen, Leslie, excuse me. Ellie, Ellen, Leslie, Jill, Deb, and I have shared our efforts with the Ambassador Program, which has reached over a thousand students countrywide and continues to grow as we reach out to further our conversations with organizations, universities, and touch points across the U.S. The Intern Program and the Intern to Employee Program have been adopted countrywide as well as, well as the concepts being implemented in other regions across MERC. These initiatives combine to offer an enhanced awareness to the broader audience, as you've heard with our ambassador team. They bring new employee candidates to the field of clinical research, individuals who've never been aware of opportunities outside of a particular degree or area of initial interest. It opens the opportunities to a richer pool of candidates through the, throughout the STEM studies, utilizing individuals that perhaps hadn't been tapped for the clinical research pool in the industry. These, these initiatives come, <clears throat> excuse me, these combined initiatives support and they align with the framework of the Joint Task Force for Harmonized Guidelines by increasing the workforce awareness and utilization of skilled collegiate professionals. They incorporate <clears throat> excuse me, rigorous training and the development standards aligned with the eight domains and the 48 core competencies. They're utilized not only as in increasing awareness through the ambassador program, but also during the time of the intern and intern to hire training programs, wherein all of the competencies and domains are incorporated into the very robust training programs for which these individuals are, into which these individuals are placed. They combine to enhance skills and competencies in support of clinical trial coordinators, CRAs, clinical research project professionals, and other clinical research professionals industry-wide. The most valuable lesson that we've learned or even continue to learn is that people and employees are our very most valuable asset. They are the core of the business that we do. So our workforce requires, better yet, it actually deserves attention development, enhancement, acknowledgement, and appreciation. This is our mission, and we will continue to grow the clinical research professional organization. Thank you, Beth. Thank you so much, Michelle and Merck team. Um, I can speak from so many in the audience, I'm sure, to all of these initiatives when we landed, clinical research landed in our laps, and we became hooked for life. But all of your programs are really um, more systematically creating opportunities for people to find out about what a great uh, profession this is. And certainly uh, we applaud all of your efforts. And at ACRP, we're continuing to do our work to grow and enhance the workforce as well. 
I believe we are very short on time after these outstanding presentations, but Kristen, um, maybe we have just one uh, or two moments to take a question from the audience uh, before we wrap up. Yes, and you're correct. We have a number of questions, but there was synergy between two. Um, one was a comment about job hopping resulting not only due to gender-driven pay inequity, but then an inability to support the cost associated with pursuing a higher degree while working in a lower wage position. And then a question was on-call pay strategies, which also speaks to staff retention. So that was kind of woven into all of our speakers' um, presentations about retaining and then career development, if anyone wants to hop in and comment. I, I can talk a little bit about the career retention and I, from the Merck perspective and the Merck programming perspective. And I think the continuation of upward um, upskilling individuals into opportunities for their current role, but while they're in their current role, ensuring that you offer opportunities for them to learn about whether it be job shadowing or other opportunities in the clin clinical research space so that you match the business need with the passion of the individual and then doing so upskill them from a training, mentoring, whatever perspective so that you can marry up their passion and whatever the business needs will assist in that employee retention piece. And, and adding in the opportunity, I know here at Merck, we offer the opportunity to continue your education while you're still pursuing your activities, whether it's in the um, intern to hire program or other opportunities in the Merck scheme. That's wonderful. Does anyone else want to hop in on um, retaining folks, especially an early career when admittedly the compensation is on, you know, the front end of the scale? All right. Um, Beth, if you have nothing further, I did want to thank you and our finalists um, and attendees for spending time with us today. Um, if there are any follow-up questions, you may reach out to Beth Harper directly. You will find her contact information in the handout that will be emailed to you after the session. And you will also receive a, um, a prompt uh, to fill out an evaluation very soon. We would appreciate your feedback. This concludes today's sessions. Please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much, everyone. Good day.